So for a country like India, economic growth has done a lot. It has pulled millions out of poverty and raised uh, standards of living. However, as we're seeing now, in, growth is not the tide that lifts all boats. And so in my work, what I'm interested is in asking how can we design public policies to help those who get left behind by growth. So despite rising education levels, the proportion of Indian women working has been steadily declining since roughly 2005. And so I've been very interested in the role of mandates of how we can actually use effective financial inclusion policies and policies like quotas um, ranging from areas like for teachers to police to politics in order to provide women the first foot into the labor market. I and my colleagues uh, show that a very simple policy in the context of India's largest social protection activity, which is NRIGA, the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, can make a huge difference. Women typically were, were getting paid into a joint household account and had led ac less access to the resources. Changing this by ensuring that they get money into their own account when they work, we show translated into increased work both in Enriga but also in the private sector. Today, every city in India has air pollution levels which are above the WHO standard for safe air. However, in my work, we have found with collaborators that there are actually a number of, of insights from economics which, if well applied, can ensure that those who are polluting are better able to internalize the social cost of air pollution. First, transparency. In Gujarat, we worked with regulators to show that if you could solve the conflict of interest that is often faced by third party auditors, then you can actually improve the quality of information they provide the regulator. And in anticipation of this, firms actually clean up. The second thing I would say, which builds on this, is that incentives matter. One of the kind of annual tragedies when it comes to air pollution is the annual crop burning cycle that occurs in October and November across all of northern India. So what we find is that if we simply promise farmers a certain amount of money for not burning their crop and say that you would pay it once they have completed their stubble management pro uh, process, we don't see any effect. And so what we showed is that if you tweak the classic payment for ecosystem contract and give a partial amount of payment upfront, that makes a big difference and it actually reduces burning. The third thing is that we should not give up on markets, rather we should actually harness markets to improve regulation. So again, together with collaborators, we have been working for the last 10 years to start an emissions trading market for particulate matter. This is now up and running in Surat. Firms are willing to participate because a market that is well run is more reliable than being at the vagaries of knowing when a regulator might try to just enforce a full lockdown on activities. And we find that this emissions market has reduced emissions from the plants by 20 to 30 percent. People always love talking about how valuable interdisciplinary collaborations is. And I think probably one of the most important ways of trying to promote these is to actually have gatherings to have to have academic exchanges where you just bring together researchers from different fields without specific explanations. I was invited for a sustainability conference that brought together um, researchers from many different areas including from public health and epidemiology and they presented some work on what they called as the South Asian paradox and this is not something I'd heard about before but it was the fact that Indian children's height is less than that of children in sub-Saharan Africa, even though many countries in sub-Saharan Africa are significantly more poor. And I was sitting there with a colleague of mine and we we're looking at this graph and said, oh, that's really interesting. And maybe we can do something here because we know that these demographic health surveys exist not just for India, but for most sub-Saharan African countries. And then finally, in trying to think about potential explanations, when we looked at the data, the most striking fact we saw was that um, first-born children in India and Africa actually are the same height. This height disadvantage increases in, among later-born children and is really pronounced for those who are what we would call birth order three or beyond. One of the major reasons why Indians have large families is because they want a son. And you can imagine that this actually then means that parents are having, having children more than they would want to have means that girls tend to come from larger families, get less nutrition, and this tends to show up 
in um, the high deficit. So indeed, my work has been extremely enriched by working with policymakers. As an economist, we go through our entire training putting a huge amount of value on the concept of abstraction. A nice clean model is one where you remove all the messy details of the world and focus on a single channel of influence. But the real world is messy and in order for the research insights to translate into policy, we need to build bridges between this world of abstract thinking and actually the messy complex world in which these research insights will be applied. Turning to the flip side of what can policymakers learn for economists, I think policymakers live in a world of emergency and they face incredible pressures from many constituents and they have fixed budgets. I think economists can help here because the basic ideas that we start with relate to trade-offs, relate to saying that when you have a limited number of resources, how can you spend them well? So I think economics within the social sciences is an unusual field because it draws both from the STEM subjects in terms of having a high emphasis on technical skills and at the same time we want economists to answer very broad ranging questions about human welfare. For the latter, I think being in India is unparalleled. I think you can just look around and see a hundred questions that you know if you could answer you would make a huge difference to people's lives. The first, I think, is harder. In fact, what I see from my university and others I've been at is increasingly the Indian students we get doing PhDs do not have an undergraduate degree in economics. And so I think the challenge, which is perhaps more for those looking to strengthen economics training in India rather than the students themselves, is how do you ensure that a student who enters an undergraduate degree in economics is able to get the technical skills they need to advance. So waking up on a Sunday morning and getting a call to hear that I had won the Infosys Prize was first of all a huge surprise and second it was deeply humbling. I felt very honoured to receive a prize that you know, many people I respect and look up to had received before me. I think at this juncture we have a number of different issues to deal with. Centrally from my perspective one of them is how are we going to get labour markets working for India's poor and especially for, for India's women. I also think that the climate breakdowns are just going to increase and if in any way by having this prize I can either through research or communication emphasize the ways in which thinking about incentives, thinking about implementation can help India uh, and Indian citizens uh, address the climate breakdowns, help them adapt better, I think that would be for me absolutely fantastic. <music>